says we are live. I'm just checking on YouTube if we are live. I, I think we're live. <laughs> Perfect. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Carvan, the Heritage Exploration Initiative. I'm Ishan Sharma, and uh, today we are back with another Carvan special lecture. So, you know, we keep uh, changing our routine of lectures. I'm really sorry for that, but it's again, it, you know, UGC has to be blamed for uh, uneven distribution of examinations, entrance examinations uh, in the schedule. So, I'm really sorry. But today, I think it's it's one of my favorite topics that we are going to discuss and we are going to listen from our speaker for the day. Uh, how do you say camera stylo in Hindi, literature, print culture, and in the Indian new wave? As you have noticed, we have done, we are doing quite a lot on the Indian new wave these days. We are interviewing filmmakers, we are hosting scholars on the Indian new wave. And as you we were discussing before the live happened that you know, there's a new interest in the new wave. Uh, these days among us, the younger generation. That's, that's good uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the study of Indian history, Indian cinematic history. So our speaker for the day, Dr. Vikran Dadawala, is a lecturer on history and literature at Harvard University, uh, where he teaches topics related to the Cold War, decolonization, and post-colonial studies. He's currently working on a book manuscript titled The Decades of Disillusionment on Themes of Post-Independence Disappointment and Heartbreak in Modern Indian Literature and Cinema in Hindi and English. Two articles based on the pro project have already, um, they are already out. They have recently been published in South Asia, uh, an essay on the life and legacy of Hindi poet Gajanan Madhav Mukti Bodh and his vision of a possible Soviet India and another on the film division of India and as an archives of the Nehruvian dream. His writings has also appeared or is forthcoming in Safundi, the Journal for uh, Cinema and Media Studies, The Point and the Chronicle of Higher Education. He received his PhD in English from the University of Pennsylvania and an ME in Developmental Studies from the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Bombay. So quite a quite long journey already, but thank you so much Dr. Dadawala for accepting my invitation and for being on Carvan. So without further ado, over to you and hope uh, we'll have some questions in the comments so that we can address so those who are watching and send in their questions during the conversation, after the conversation on, on our YouTube live. Over to you, sir. Thank, thank you so much, Ishan, and thanks for having me, and thanks for that generous introduction. So, um, yeah, as you said, my talk today is on uh, literature, print culture, and the Indian New Wave. And it's going to be a kind of broad overview. I'm not going to speak very much about specific films. I'll speak about three of my, you know, three of my favorite films from this time, but not in great detail. So, you know, if you have questions about the films, I do hope to talk about it in, you know, in, in the chat that follows. So, yeah, let's get straight to it. So in 1969, as is well known, three unusual Hindi films started doing the rounds of the film festival circuit in India. These were Basu Chatterjee's Bhuvan, uh, Sara Akash, Minal Sen's Bhuvan Shom, and Money Calls Uski Roti, right, which was eventually released in 1970. Now, these were very different films, as we know, uh, but they all shared the same cinematographer, uh, you know, the FDI trained uh, KK Mahajan, and they all wore the visual influence of European art cinema on their sleeves, right? They were, they were proud of it. Um, crucially, following in the footsteps of Satyat Ray's Apu trilogy, all three were adaptations of modern Indian literature. Now, since the early 1960s, Indian cinephiles had been hungry for a homegrown new wave, right? And this hunger had been whetted by their exposure to the few art films that circulated through the efforts of amateur film clubs and, and the kind of International Film Festival, which was held, uh, you know, for the first time in 52, then in 55, and then annually after that, in six, from 65 onwards. So to contemporary audiences, you know, the near simultaneous appearance of these three films with their whimsical editing, their fresh face casts, the naturally lit images of the world outside of studio sets felt like a breath of fresh air. It seemed like the new wave moment had finally arrived in India or had it. Uh, so a generous catalog of the Indian new wave or the new Indian cinema would compromise, you know, um, you know, would comprise around 112 films in five languages. Yet barring a small set of films, uh, little critical attention has been paid to the new Indian cinema, which occupies a kind of blind spot in our discourses of world cinema. It's not very well archived. It's not taught very often outside of India, and it's not watched very often uh, globally. Although I know this is changing and, 
you know, initiatives like this are part of what's bringing, bringing the new wave back. So my talk is on a relatively obscure but remarkable aspect of Indian, of the Indian new wave, which is the deep and enduring ties with modern Indian literature that allowed new wave cinema to serve as a contact zone between the worlds of print and celluloid. Right. And this happened partly due to the Film Finance Corporation's preference for funding low budget films based on the work of eminent writers in Hindi and other national languages. And I'm quoting from the Karanja Committee recommendations here. And this also happened partly because of the middle class's own investment in print culture during this period of socialism and relative economic stagnation. Right. So this is coming, you know, both from above, it's being imposed by the state, but it's also coming from below. There's a real hunger in the audience for a cinema that they think of as literary. And you can really see this. For instance, in an article I came across in Dharmyug in 1972, where the author talks about, you know, wanting to go into a bookstore and pick up a book that says on its cover, now adopted into a feature, uh, into a feature film, right? There's, there's a hunger for Hindi literary culture or Indian literary culture in general to be given that kind of respect and dignity. So not only did an astonishing number of new wave films have their roots in modern Indian literature, the very form of this cinema often aspired towards literariness. You know, the ideal was of a sahityak cinema, as, as the Hindi journals of the time put it. There has been some analysis of the film literature relationship in languages like Bengali, Kannada, and Marathi. I'm going to focus on Hindi, uh, which is, uh, in my opinion, a largely unstudied relationship. Uh, so to come back to my title, right, the idea of the camera stillo comes to us uh, from a famous essay in 1948 by the French critic Alexander Astro. And this essay really embodies this kind of dream of a cinema to come, which will be lightweight, which will be mobile, which will be deeply personal and deeply artistic, right, in which the camera will become as easy to use, as accessible, as democratic as a pen. So what I'm really talking about today is the Indian version of this. Uh, what kind of camera pen did we evolve in Hindi? So before the new wave moment, uh, the popular Hindi cinema had mostly ignored Hindi literature, turning instead to Urdu for the poetic language in which it would speak of love, faith, justice. All of these terms come to us from, from the Urdu, right? It was a new cinema that would bring the more Sanskritic vocabulary of Hindi into theaters for the first time. So three distinct forms uh, emerged out of this collaboration between Hindi writers and the Indian new wave. So first up, you had a genre of lighthearted light comedies about middle class life. Uh, you know, most often what, what we think of today as the middle cinema or the parallel cinema. This, you know, often took the form of collaborations between writers like Kamleshwar and Manu Bandari and filmmakers like Basu Chakaji and Rishikesh Mukherjee. Uh, then you had an avant-garde and modernist cinema that emerged out of collaborations between modernist Hindi writers uh, like Nirmal Verma, Mohan Rakesh, Ramesh Bakshi, and filmmakers like Mani Kaul and Kumar Shani. And then finally, you had a kind of political issue-based cinema that developed more or less concurrently with the human rights movement in India. And this is most closely associated with the Marathi playwright Vijay Tendulkar and with filmmakers like Sham Benekal and Gobind Nilani, right? Now, the political and aesthetic differences between uh, all these kinds of films are significant, and I, I don't mean to underplay them, but they all share an orientation towards vernacular literary culture uh, that extends beyond uh, you know, individual stories or novels serving as sources for the films, right? Film and literature, and to some extent theater as well, uh, participate in the same debates about realism, modernism, and socialism, right? They all share the same conviction about the urgency of art in, in, in dark times and about, you know, in an era of widespread pessimism about India's economic future. So let me begin by uh, talking about the kind of institutional framework from which this emerged. So the most vital role in creating and sustaining this, this short-lived nexus between Hindi literature and the Indian new wave was played by popular general interest magazines like Dharmyug, Sarika, and Dinman, which were really, uh, you know, India's equivalents of life and Reader's Digest, right? Um, it's, it would be difficult to overstate the importance of these magazines in this time, um, or, or of what uh, scholars like Akriti Mandwani have called their middle-brow cosmopolitanism. Right, which I think is a wonderful phrase that really describes what they're like. Uh, they really, you know, they really cap, you know, they really, not only did they shape middle class opinion, these magazines are kind of like the center of gravity in which you can track the public sphere of that time. So if you, if you know, if you flip through their pages now, it's kind of like watching a stop motion film in which you can see Nairobian socialism slowly coming apart. Right. They took uh, all of these magazines, took uh, Hindi's ambition to be independent India's preeminent national language quite seriously. And they frequently carry translations from other Indian languages, as well as reports on world literature, world cinema, politics. They were edited by prominent Hindi literatures. 
रघुवीर भारती एडिटेड धर्मयुग कमलेश्वर एडिटेड सारिका रघुवीर सहाय रघुवीर रघुवीर सहाय सॉरी एडिटेड दिनमान एंड दे ऑल बिकेम अर्ली एंड वॉसिफरस चैंपियंस ऑफ द इंडियन न्यू वेव राइट एंड दे हेल्प मेक इवन न्यू वेव डायरेक्टर्स हु नेवर रियली हैड अ पॉपुलर रिलीज लाइक पीपल लाइक मणि कॉल एंड अदर्स दे हेल्प मेक इवन दीस डायरेक्टर्स इनटू हाउस होल्ड नेम्स बाय फीचरिंग रिव्यूज एंड इंटरव्यूज एंड एंड बाय जनरेटिंग डिस्कोर्स अराउंड देयर फिल्म्स राइट एंड द वेरियस सोशल मूव movements that emerged in india in the 1970s also left their traces on these magazines just as they did on the indian new wave so uh the relationship then between the indian new wave and these magazines went beyond that of you know patronage or publicity they both reflected the anxieties concerns and desires of the same audience uh not only would people like kamleshwar and and tarvir bharti go on to write screenplays for new wave films uh you can see the same uh desires that animated the audience um reflected in 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 these magazines and what i have here is a collection of advertisements from sarika and you can see you know it's it's scooters it's new clothes it's uh, you know polyester clothes of that time it's 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 cold drink you know it's it these are the small luxuries like a small cup of coffee in a restaurant animate these magazines and and the figures in these advertisements they look like they could have stepped out of a film by basu chash basu chatterjee rishikesh mukherjee or sai paranjpe right so what did the middle class literary culture of this time look like consider for instance uh, the sarika issue dated uh, 7 july 1978 uh, which is the one you have uh, the table of contents on the screen in front of you um, which is a special issue on short stories so sarika under kamleshwar had fashioned itself as a hindi magazine with a keen sense of world literature it featured translations from japanese and arabic it had updates on the latest swedish cinema it had translations from a range of other south asian languages including urdu maithili bengali sindhi marathi under kamleshwar sarika had also become a keen promoter of a sensibility that kamleshwar called the samantar kahani andolan or the parallel story movement which was directly inspired by the cinema right and it was grounded in the same way in the kind of banal struggles of everyday life of the of the middle class in the towns and cities of north india uh this issue um reflected this invigor- invigorating editorial mix uh you can see a, a mix of provincial and cosmopolitan text from india and abroad there's a column on little magazines that reports on the latest developments in hindi bengali french there's um, uh, an excerpt from uh, the british citizen mary tyler's uh, diary about being Uh, held as a prisoner during the emergency there's a lengthy interview with agya the sort of doyen of hindi modernism uh, and interspersed with this kind of intellectual content are advertisements for the kind of products that people felt hindi readers would be interested in so these are these include english speaking courses hair removal creams bindis talcum powder toothpaste castor hair oil so one of the readers of this particular issue was a young film student called raman kumar uh, who i have a photo of on the right and you got to imagine him young and and fresh out of the film school uh, actually fresh in the film school at this point reading this magazine right so, so as a student at the film institute in pune kumar found himself fascinated by a short story in this issue titled columbus zinda hai right which is a rather bleak and spare short story about marriage love and disillusionment uh, uh, by narendra morya who is a writer from a remote part of central india not very well known then columbus zinda hai uh, is told in the first person from the point of view of miss kanguli uh, who is the daughter of a provincial bureaucrat who falls in love uh, with uh, with someone who her parents don't approve of who is you know a, a, a young intellectual the, the columbus of their little world right this story would go on to form the kernel of raman kumar's popular debut film which is the charming saath saath starring farooq sheikh and deepthi nawal i'm sure many of you have seen this if you haven't seen this you've definitely heard the songs um i'm not going to show you a clip from the film because that would take too long but very briefly to sort of summarize what happens so kumar's adaptation injects new characters comic sequences and songs into the rather threadbare plot of the story he found in sarika he alters its tone significantly instead of being set in central india this film is set in bombay and it explores um the pleasures of wealth and upward mobility just as much as it does the kind of privations and resentment of middle class life in the mufassil right uh, so the film's relationship then i would say to the lower middle class ethos of its literary source is a little ambivalent it's as if the advertisements have also bled into the story mixing all kinds of contradictory desires together so in this case the the young female protagonist geeta uh, is played by deepthi nawal and it's she's not as helpless a character as the miss ganguly of the story uh she elopes with her columbus who's called avinasha played by farooq sheik she takes up a job as a school teacher she uh, you know uh, has no second thoughts about leaving her nice home in malabar hill to make a new uh, a new marriage and a new life with the man uh, she chooses to marry um it's actually not her in the film but the fury sort of 
socialist uh, orator Farooq Sheikh who cracks under the pressure of the long lines, tiresome routine and the daily humiliations of middle class life. So Avinash, uh, played by Farooq Sheikh, uh, after college takes up a job in a publisher's firm and he ditches his socialist ideals. Uh, he offers bribes to government agencies, he starts exploiting authors and you know he gives up his kind of austere kurta pajama for polyester clothes and instead of uh, you know quoting urdu poetry he starts uh, needlessly throwing in english words into his everyday speech and you know that kind of uh, marks the the depth of his fall so what i find very interesting about sat sat is that because it's such a naive film i think so transparent in its valorization of adarshwad right idealism it brings to the surface often invisible aspects of the of the cinema and literary culture of the time so sat sat's response to uh, the middle class's growing consumerism is conflicted. It often takes the form of a moralist contempt for wealth and a valorization of simple living, right? And, and, we're, and we're familiar with this, right? From Indian intellectual and activist culture. It's the world of print, sahitya, books and newspapers that begin to constitute the foundation of middle-class life in the film to the point where, uh, you know, Samajwad and sahitya or socialism and literariness become indistinguishable. Um, a couple of examples. So before he becomes a kind of evil uh, capitalist publisher, uh, Avinash uh, works as a freelance writer who, who, you know, who writes pro-worker articles that are rejected by newspapers because the newspapers are owned by the same sort of tycoons who own the factories, right? He's also the proud author of a novel about life in the slums of Bombay. Uh, it's this literary figure, this literary Columbus with whom Gita and the camera fall in love amidst the library stacks of Mumbai University's Kalina campus. And the fissures in Gita and Avinash's marriage also take the form of disagreements about literature. Avinash refuses to publish uh, you know, social realist novels. He, he now says the only books worth publishing are romantic fantasies and crime thrillers, right? And he later adds pornography into the list. Uh, he becomes an expert in bribing uh, uh, government officers to sell textbooks. Uh, he refuses to join his former mentor in, uh, you know, in taking up their long cherished dream of setting up an independent newspaper. So in ways both banal and profoundly existential, Avinash and Gita's idealism and political life is enfolded within a world of print. Right, the limits of their political agency are marked by the course of the books that are never published and by the amateur sort of socialist newspaper that remains a pipe dream of the intellectuals. So this struggle between literature and, and, you know, and consumerism, between austerity and, and the good life that Satsa dramatizes was a key feature of, of the entire Indian New Wave movement. And especially, I would say, the middle cinema, the parallel cinema, right? And we can see it in, you know, in, in the kind of makeover sequences that recur in, in, in films by Rishikesh Mukherjee and Basu Chatterjee. We can see it in sequences where you contrast, you know, the kinetic pleasure of uh, driving through the city in, in an ambassador car versus waiting at the bus stop for the bus to come, which is going to be, you know, intensely crowded. And formally, we can see this in a style that sort of tries to marry the serious virtues of literature with the pleasures of cinema, right? And you can see it in, in the kind of hybrid narrative modes, right? For instance, the, the kind of literary frame story that, uh, that that surrounds Anand, right, uh, uh, and 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 sort of uh, you know uh, uh, holds that story within it, or you can see it in the in the kind of interior monologues of a film like Rajni Kanda, which which signal to its uh, kind of literary roots. So in Saat Saat, this conflict between idealism and uh, uh, you know politics, between literature and cinema, doesn't end with the dissolution of the marriage, but it, the film holds out the possibility of reconciliation. Uh, between socialist principles and the quest for a good life, uh, between print and celluloid. Um, it, it holds out the possibility that the Gitas and Avinashes of 1980s India will be able to formulate a new socialist vocabulary that's different from that of their parents. Right? And when I interviewed him in October 2018, Raman Kumar suggested that this, this, uh, this, this was the product of a particular moment that is no longer active. So I'm going to just pull up uh, what Raman Kumar said to me, the director of Satsat said to me right here on the screen. Uh, and you can read it. Oh, I'll just read it out, actually. So Raman Kumar says, I experienced the 1980s as a time of hope, as a time when socialism was being reinvented all over the world. Our generation had a lot of hope in the ability of literature, theater, and cinema to create a different world. The real disillusionment would come later after the fall of the Soviet Union and the failure of any of the Indian Communist parties to live up to their promise. Ours was the last generation of truly literary filmmakers. We used to subscribe to literary magazines in our, in our hostel rooms at the Film Institute in Pune and carry them around in our pockets to read on buses. Most of these magazines are now defunct. You can count the number of films based on literary sources on your finger now. And even then, the source is almost always an English book. 
the link between cinema and Hindi literature will end with my generation. So, now, it's perhaps too early to say if Raman Kumar's intuition that his would be the last generation of filmmakers to be inspired by Hindi literature will turn out to be correct. But it is clear that a certain period has ended. In the 1990s, the Times of India group shuttered uh, uh, all, all the big Hindi magazines they used to run. Dharm Yug, Sarika, Dinman as part of an ag aggressive rebranding strategy. And uh, really, there's a wonderful New Yorker article called Citizen Gen, if you're interested, uh, that you should look up. Um, the middle brow Hindi literary culture of that time never recovered. So me growing up in the 90s, I didn't grow up with Dharm Yug and Sarika, right? I grew up with ZTV and Channel V. And it is also true, I think, uh, as, as your generation will note, that it's Indian writing in English that is now becoming the source for most adaptations, right? If you if you open any of your OTT platforms, uh, you know, Sacred Games, Pata Lok, Suitable Boy, Serious Men, they're all coming from Indian writing in English. So uh, whether, you know, Raman Kumar's does turn out to be the last generation of filmmakers uh, to have strong links with Hindi or not, it's clear that a certain moment ended in the 90s. And this was the moment of the Indian New Wave, right? So with this broader institutional framework in mind, Right. Let's let's sort of step back for a second from the Indian New Wave and compare the Indian New Wave to French art cinema, which was uh, at that point the default model for new film movements all over the world. Right. So in general, I think our mythology surrounding the French New Wave as a kind of radical break can sometimes obscure the fact that the global prestige of French cinema to which Indian filmmakers were not immune by any means uh, really came uh, more than a little. It, it, it owed more than a little to filmmakers collaborations with the literary omar card. Right. These included uh, especially the ones that happened with this kind of left bank group of filmmakers and writers, and they, they ended up creating a shared sort of literary and cinematic culture that was, um, as some critics have put it, alternatively or interconnectedly filmic and novelic. And you can see this reflected in the cinematic techniques of some of the literature of that time by, by people like Jean Cocteau, Margaret Dura, Alan Rob Grillet, as well as in the literary style of filmmakers like Alain Rena, Robert Bresson, and Chris Marker. And the site of these collaborations was Paris, right? Which as Pascal Casanova in her uh, you know, a magnificent book on world literature puts it, Paris, which was the site where the Greenwich Meridian of European aesthetic modernity passed, right? The, the center of this kind of European uh, intellectual culture. Now, unlike French, right? Hindi enjoyed very little prestige or cultural capital in the world literary marketplace during the Indian new wave period. Even its domestic claim to being a national language was, ex it was, was quite shaky, right? It was undercut not only by its limited geographical reach, but also by the presence of older rivals like Urdu, Braj, Methli, even within the so-called Hindi heartland, right? A literature cinema nexus didn't develop in, uh, in, in Hindi until 69. And, um, uh, you know, when when, when it's, it, it was uh, helped, uh, helped along by the film finance corporation's explicit requirement for films to be based on literature. So following in the footsteps of their French gurus, Omagard Indian filmmakers like Kumar Shani and Manikal, whose pictures are on the screen there, they turned to the Nai Kahani uh, corpus in Hindi, right, as a source for a new kind of literary cinema. Like Bresson, uh, Shani and Call's engagement with modernist literature and painting was quite serious, quite cerebral, quite deconstructive. You know, this is a mode of adaptation that we can best describe as refractive rather than simple, uh, following uh, Andre Brazan. But the, 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 I think the important thing to note here is the crucial time lag between when the Nai Kahani came out in the 50s and when these films started coming out in the late 60s and early 70s. When the new Kahani, when the Nai Kahani or the, or the new story movement in Hindi had emerged in the 1950s, it was a time of relative optimism. The screen adaptations responded to a different chronotope, which was the decades of underdevelopment and disillusionment that followed the kind of crises of the 1960s, which I, which I won't, won't list here for now. For Hindi uh, writers in particular, these were years characterized by a bitter mobham, which is you know, kind of Hindi for uh, broken love or, or disenchantment, right? Uh, in unemployment and inflation were at dangerous levels. There were growing levels of working class militancy, which you can see in the you know, culminating in the kind of railway strike of 74. There were unending lines for ration food and kerosene that saw even middle class households participate in the picking of ration shops. The most popular poetry in Hindi circles spoke of bitterness, disappointment, inchoate rage of bullet holes in street corners and of, you know, maps slopped with cow dung. And obviously I'm thinking here of Dhumil's Beast Salbad, but you can also think of uh, something like Alok Danwa's Janta Kadmi or Goli Dago poster, or you can think of Rajkamal Chaudhary's Mukti Prasang, right? All of, all of these really captured that kind of um, uh, curdled anger with the Nairobian project that was the context in which these, uh, these uh, films came out. So 
that sense of provinciality and belatedness became central uh, to these adaptations of of uh, of cinema which in which in which case the you know the the center of modernity often passed through the mufassil regions rather than through the metropolis um, and this mufassil modernism would come to be a characteristic feature of the avant-garde in the indian new wave right and what you can see here is is still from money called satya utta admi you can see the kind of restless wandering uh, through the streets of small town india that's a feature of the film and you know with time the kind of celluloid has degraded and gotten this kind of apocalyptic purplish hue which which also seems to me somehow appropriate right as if these films are coming from a kind of hidden timeline of indian history outside of the normal one right so even from the ur of uh, nai kahani writers like mohan rakesh and nirmal verma it wouldn't be stories about a uh, cosmopolitan life in europe or middle class life in new delhi that would fascinate uh, our filmmakers right it would be melancholic stories about waiting and paralysis set in transient spaces between the countryside and the city um, and varma himself noted this in a kind of slightly miffed article for dharmyu uh, held back by censorship as well as by perpetual lack of funds there would be no uh, iconic kisses like that of uh, jean paul belmondo and anna karina uh, in the indian new wave right disillusionment rather than uh, joy would be its dominant flavor and and this really is is the kind of uh, uh, you know striking feature of films like uh, uski roti adapted from a short story by mohan rakesh maya darpan adapted from a short story by nirmal verma 27 down adapted from a novella by ramesh bakshi satya se utta aadmi which is adapted from the work of mukti bodh and nokar ki kameez which is adapted from vinod kumar shukla you can see this mufassil mufassil modernism become tangible in the chronotope of of a figure kind of waiting by uh, you know by a railway station or by a bus stop in a small provincial town so you have taran in a red sari standing by the single gauge train tracks in maya darpan you have you know waiting for the for the world in the maps that the engineer babu shows her to really come alive or balo waiting in the midst of a dust storm in uski roti um these kind of small towns became the settings which were uh, the ground zero of a post colonial modernity that had already started to decay right it's a space of suspended promises where past and future meet and 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 this this really becomes uh, the feature of uh, the modernist wing of the indian new wave and uh, the film i did want to talk about here as an example is a relatively obscure film from this period uh, which uh, i do hope everybody watches I, I i do highly recommend it which is avatar krishna calls 27 down so 27 down was released posthumously in 1974 after the tragic death of its young director and it it begins with a confession of failure and i'm just going to show you a very short clip right which 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 gives you a sense of the mood of the film नंबर सताइस डाउन वाराणसी एक्सप्रेस अब प्लेटफॉर्म नंबर तीन पे जाने के लिए तैयार है लोग हैं जो एक जगह से दूसरी जगह तक जाते हैं मैं हूं कि कहीं से चलकर कहीं भी चला जा रहा आप लेडीज में क्यों नहीं चढ़ गए वहां तो इससे भी ज्यादा हुए थे लोग एक दिन या एक रात के बाद कहीं पहुंचते हैं और मैं एक ख्याल के बाद दूसरे ख्याल पर पहुंच जाता दिन रात भी अगर मेरी ड्यूटी लगाई जाए तो मुझे कोई एतराज नहीं कहा रहते हैं आप मैं तो ये कहूंगा कि बम्बई में ट्रेनें ना होती तो हमारी मुलाकात ना होती क्या तुम्हें सच में I'm going to stop it there. Uh what I do want you to note is the quality of the literary monologue here, right? With with its kind of uh with its with MK Rena's, you know, crisp diction with with its slightly tense interiority uh, this film promises to bring to audiences uh, a world that has rarely been seen on screen which is the world of hindi literary modernism right today the film has become slightly obscure when we do talk about it we think of uh, the cinematography especially right um uh, which is kind of inspired by battle of algiers and was handheld and really uh, gave us this fascinating vision of the railway as a, as the link that binds the metropolis to the to the countryside but our understanding of this film and of the indian new wave will remain partial i think without a more sort of substantial engagement with the literary field that it, you know that was the intermediary between cinema and history right that which which sort of shaped how cinema engaged with history uh, and so in this case we'd have to turn to a now out of print modernist novella by a forgotten master of the post 1960s literature of mohan which is the hindi writer ramesh bakshi 
So by and large, in fact, this film is a pretty straightforward adaptation of Bakshi's novella, which I'm going to just tell you about a little bit. Uh, it was called Athara Suraj Ke Paude, which means the seedlings of 18 sons. And the title uh, has, has a mythological reference. It, it refers to the battle of uh, uh, the 18 day battle of uh, in the battle of, uh, of Kurukshetra in, in the Mahabharata, right? Uh, Athara Suraj Ke Paude tells the story of the sentimental education of a 24 year old train conductor named Sanjay. His name too is coming, coming from the Mahabharata. Despite his mythological name, the Sanjay of both the book and the film is a kind of melancholic, fatalistic character. He's trapped in between village and city. He's unable to transcend what Sanjay Joshi has called the fractured modernity of the North Indian middle classes. So Sanjay, played by MK Raina, dreams of becoming a painter or a sculptor, but he's forced to take up a job in the Indian railways by his overbearing patriarchal father. A miraculous almost miraculously a kind of chance encounter uh, with a fellow passenger played by Rakhi in the dehumanizing crush of the train uh, brings him some color and hope into his dry life. He falls in love with her and she seems like a modern woman who has a life and a job of her own, but neither of them are willing to make the decisive break with their families that would allow them to sort of separate and live out their own lives and, and have a modern companionate marriage. So their love remains uh, incomplete. Uh, Instead, Sanjay is forced by his father to marry the daughter of a rich rural landlord uh, and, uh, you know, whose kind of rustic ways really disgust him. And as a dowry, uh, this kind of urbane and bookish figure receives four buffaloes, right? Creatures that seem to be advancing towards him in his nightmares, taking over his home and consciousness. And to me, this is one of the, this is one of the most striking images of uh, the fractured modernity of those times, right? The kind of the buffaloes that that keep advancing towards this guy who wants to be urban uh, and you know an urban intellectual, but who keeps getting pulled back. Um, so trapped into a life he never wanted, Sanjay becomes a wandering drifter, disappearing from home for long stretches of time, uh, unable to love his wife, uh, to repair the bond with Shalini. Both the novel and the film brim over with resentment, regret, help rage. And these are moods, I think, characteristic of the Sarthotari or post-1960s Hindi literature, which consists really of a, ge a generation of, of would-be radicals, right, who, who wrote a lot of manifestos, but were kind of powerless to change these, uh, these the overwhelming social structures that they were faced with. So the title of the book, right, comes from the Hindu epics, but it's non-linear experimental prose really draws on cinematic techniques like flashbacks, close-up, ostentatious montages, and the use of cuts on sound to transition between scenes. And these mark the novel itself as coming from the same film generation as French writers like Alain Robert Grillet, Dura, or, or even Julio Cortazar. The preface, in his preface to the book, Ramesh Bakshi uh, invokes the internationalism of early 20th century European modernism. But if, if, uh, you know, if the novella is an avant-garde text, I'll, I'll, I'll describe it as an avant-garde text that's that's turned sour, that's been kind of derailed. So in his preface, Bakshi says, what do I care for futurism, which is uh, the speeded up version of cubism. All I have borrowed from it is its gati and mixed it up with countless things from around me, machines, sound, uh, sounds, descriptions, instruments, noises, struggles, wars, piston gears and balance wheels. And you can see this debt to Italian futurism in the kind of extended metaphor that, that structures the book, which is the, the relationship between Sanjay as a representative of the Indian Railways. And in fact, at some point in both the book and the film, he kind of just says this explicitly. I'm Sanjay, I am the Indian Railways. Sanjay is born on a moving train. His life, you know, remains bound up with this kind of emblem of modernity in India. Uh, as a kid, he idealizes his, his father, who's a, who's a trade engine driver. And, and you can see the, the railways really lending uh, the kind of, uh, you know, the rhythm to the, to the prose of the book itself. Um, but unlike uh, the, you know, the sort of human mechanical protagonists of Italian futurism from the early 20th century, uh, the Indian railway in the 1970s was overcrowded and accident prone, right? And Sanjay himself feels like he's trapped in the narrow lanes of the present. And, uh, you know, the both past and future seem to him to be asleep and his journey is ultimately a circular. So throughout the book, throughout the film, we have images of train accidents, broken limbs, um, uh, you know, Sanjay remains transfixed by an image he sees in his childhood, which is that of a, of a, of a, you know, a railway bogey that has been abandoned, that is in the middle of nowhere, just getting dust, useless, right? And so the, the, the film adaptation, when compared to the novel, it really shows us, I think, uh, both the strengths and some of the weaknesses of the Indian New Wave. So the film is largely realist in tone, but it retains an avant-garde impulse in its visual obsession with the railways as a kind of perplexing and contradictory symbol of movement and stasis, escape and entrapment, uh, coincidence and fate. 
Uh, most of the film's memorable sequences feature the trains. There's a long shot of the crowds coming out of VT station, uh, and it's just impossible. I mean, they just keep piling out on and on out of the train. There are documentary style images of homeless people on, on station benches. There's a withered old priest offering prayers to the to the river as to the Ganga as the as the train goes past a bridge. Um, if the famous train sequence uh, of Pothir Panchali, where uh, you know the train sort of zooms past the the screen and, and the smoke takes over the entire horizon, if that sequence epitomized the sort of techno optimism of Nehruvian modernity, then it's the melancholy, regretful, vagabond train sequences of Twenty Seven Down that I think reflect the waning of this optimism, its replacement by a disillusionment. No trace of the hope uh, animating uh, Ray's depiction of the railways as an engine of modernity in Pothir Panchali seems to survive in 27 Down. Beyond the two protagonists, on either side of the railway tracks, the Indian countryside sort of stretches out like an endless wasteland of missed opportunities. Number Sorry about that. So uh, finally, I want to uh, conclude by turning to the to the last major genre that emerged from the Indian New Wave, which was that of the political cinema, social realist films that explored the persistence of landlessness, poverty, caste violence in rural India, following the failure of uh, land reform policies or of the Bhutan movement to make a kind of substantial impact on India's agrarian structure. So the bleak themes of these films reflected the urgency of what was called the agrarian question uh, by social scientists in 60s and 70s in India, as tensions between laborers and landowning farmers exploded into violences in places as far apart as Tanjur in Tamil Nadu or Naxalbari in West Bengal. And, and you can see a sort of collection of these headlines in this document from the PUDR, right, which is just, uh, just a collection of headlines about agrarian violence in, in, in the 70s. So three quick features to note about this tradition. One, this is a topical issue-based cinema. The thrust is on exposition and explanation rather than on complexity. But as Ira Bhaskar reminds us, the simplicity of these films can sometimes be deceptive. Through the tracking camera, the pan, the deep shot, the long take, the films hint at a reality that lies just beyond the surface, right? Two, they were shot on location using muted soft Eastman color, and they featured quasi-ethnographic scenes and attempts to create a kind of authentic mise-en-scene, authentic locations and sets. But the, the, the kind of uh, art they most closely resemble, I think, is that of a news feature. Rather, you know, the, the kind of rootedness and ecology of rural life is really missing from these films, right? Uh, you don't see equivalents of Renu or Baba Nagarjun in, in, these, cinema, in these films, right? Rather, the, the thrust is on making things uh, legible to the national viewer, who's, who's imagined really as a kind of urban, uh, Hindi-speaking, upper-caste uh, person, right? But at the same time, I would say that, that these same features are part of what made it the site of crucial intermediary conversations across Indian languages. In its heyday, the Hindi Indian New Wave created a powerful interface between Hindi, Bengali, and Marathi literary culture. So it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't just Hindi in that sense. And, uh, uh, you know, as the, and, and we can see this most powerfully in the work of Vijay Tendulkar, of course, and uh, who was also the president of a human rights organization. And as the caste atrocities and agrarian struggles of the post-Green Revolution period are sort of forgotten or kind of removed from our memory, I think the, the new wave films and the human rights movement together constitute a very valuable archive of this time of kind of blood and, and violence or, you know, a time of, of flaming fields to quote another document from that time. So the film uh, I wanted to very briefly uh, take you through uh, as a representative of this moment of literature cinema connection is Gautam Ghosh's Par, uh, which is, I think, the Indian New Wave's sort of most moving film about the endemic caste violence of the period. It's partially adapted from a Bengali short story by Somarish Basu. So as is well known, the 60s and 70s were a time of, uh, you know, uh, saw a wave of agrarian violence in, in Bihar um, as, as, as the landless confronted uh, landlord castes over issues like the denial of minimum wages, the failure to implement land reform, or issues of dignity and self-respect. And the immediate sort of context for the film Par was, a, was one such massacre uh, that took place uh, in the village of Pipra and Patna district on the night of February 25, 26, 1980. And this was covered very prominently in newspapers because you know, Pipra is not, not at all far from Patna. Today, you can take an Uber uh, down to it, right? That's how, that's how close it is. 
So like most of these films, the origins, uh, like most uh, new wave films uh, about politics, the origins lie in the newspaper with the young director's encounter uh, with, with a headline that sort of confuses and mystifies them. And at that time, Gautam Ghosh uh, was a rising uh, young star uh, of the Indian new wave known for his documentaries about dispossession and for, for the uh, Telugu film Mabhumi. Um, initially, he had wanted to make a documentary, but after, after, after doing a location scout, he decided to make a feature film. And in a flash, the Somresh Basu story came to him as, as, as the thing he should adapt, the thing, the, the, what, the source for what should be the allegorical climax of his film. And um, what he said to me when I interviewed him is that he, he had encountered the story sometime in the 70s and found it to be an amazing metaphor for human endurance, for the tremendous feats that human beings are capable of. So he started with the story and then worked backwards to give, to give a sort of backstory to uh, the more sort of archetypal protagonist of Basu's story. So I, I'm not gonna show you a clip, uh, but you can really see the two impulses uh, in, 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 in the two sequences that bookend the film, right? So this is the first one where you see the, the suddenly the, the kind of caste violence exploding into the village. And it, it starts kind of in the kind of unbroken darkness of the countryside at this time. And you must remember electrification of Bihari villages was still, was still some time away. You have headlights approaching and these headlights are kind of menacing because they can't be bringing anything good. And then later you have the, the you know, the, the kind of the people who've come to, to burn down the, 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 the Dalit Tola of the village, uh, their, their sort of flashlights and torches giving us the illumination for that scene. And finally, uh, it's, it's, it's the kind of burning village itself that lights up the screen. And then this is the, is the final sequence, which uh, was actually the first to be shot. And, and Nasruddin at this point didn't really know how to swim. So uh, he had to be you know, pulled out of the Hooghly three times by, by, uh, by divers. And the, the, the river itself was in full monsoon spate. And, and I think the restoration does allow us to, to see that a little bit in, in the color and tone of the film. And the final sequence consists of these two characters taking a herd of pigs across the river Hooghly. And you know, um, uh, what you realize in that moment is that uh, these two, uh, the labor of these two characters is worth, uh, the market rate for it is less than the price of a boat. Right, which is why uh, somebody would rather pay them to swim across the river with the pigs than pay for a boat, right? And this is kind of the sort of awful realization it, it ends us with. Um, what, what I wanna uh, highlight here is that unlike the third cinema style documentaries of the 1970s, uh, like, you know, like Tapan Bose's An Indian Story, um, uh, the new wave films managed to get an audience that exceeded that of activists or students, right? They went beyond the campus and actually came on the television, which is where most people saw them. Nasruddin Shah ended up winning the Volpi Cup for best actor uh, for his performance as Norangi and Par, and Par became a popular film on TV. Uh, we can think of the gap between the original event and its reenactment on, on, in, in the sort of screen of the Indian new wave as a kind of condition of visibility, right? This is the only way that uh, the anonymous survivors of, uh, of the caste violence of this time could, could be legible and could appear on screens, right? And so like the many kind of fact-finding reports that uh, Indian journalists and human rights activists uh, wrote about the caste violence of this time, PAR also cloaks its politics in, in the sort of uh, rhetoric of an address to civil society, right? But I think the, uh, the crucial thing to note here is that, you know, two years after Par, in response to yet another massacre, uh, a big group of retired judges, writers, filmmakers, students and teachers came together to form the Indian People's Human Rights Commission uh, to act as an agency of opinion and conscience. And the president was in your cinema filmmaker, Mrinal Sen, uh, it, it, and the tribunal seemed to be modeled on the International War Crimes Tribunal led by veteran Russell and Jean-Paul uh, Jean Sartre, which had played an important role in, in changing public opinion around, around the war in Vietnam. However, I think what uh, the lesson of this time is, is really that the post-colonial Indian intelligentsia, which is lawyers, teachers, writers, new cinema filmmakers, simply didn't possess the same power to mold public opinion and state policy that you know, intellectuals like Sartre and Bertrand Russell did in relatively bourgeois Europe, or even in the way that violent caste militias like the Ranveer Sena or the Sunlight Sena did closer home, right? This sociological fact really marks the sort of political limits then of the literature cinema nexus of that time. And in retrospect, I think one, this is one of the most uh, striking features of the Indian New Wave. It's the recurrence of scenes of disillusionment that sort of undermine any coherent ideological meaning. These are scenes in which urban middle-class protagonists head into rural India and confront something 
that that sort of exceeds the limits of their understanding, right? And you can see this in films like Maya Darpan, Ashani Sanke, Jupti Dako Gopo, Nishant, Akrosh, um, Amarian, and others, right? And I, I, I do think this really is the most valuable legacy of the Indian New Wave for us to pick up. What looks really like a cinema of resistance or protest reveals itself uh, in retrospect when we take a closer glance at it to be quite introspective about its own failures and limits. And this and, and, the, and the kind of rethinking that this realization can, can prompt, I think, is, is what we can now take up uh, from the Indian New Wave. So by way of conclusion, right, we, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, skip forward past uh, sociological explanations for why Hindi literature and cinema came apart in the 1990s. I've proposed three factors on the screen that you can read, and, and I'm happy to answer any questions now or later about how I think these factors came together to pull cinema and literature apart in the 1990s. What I want to leave you with is an image from what I think is really the last sort of film of note in the Indian New Wave tradition, which is Said Mirza's Naseem or The Morning Breeze. Um, uh, for th those of you who've seen the film know that it stars Kefi Azmi as a kind of uh, aging uh, old uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, old man who was, who was an activist in, in the freedom struggle in the 1940s. Uh, in the context of the approaching uh, uh, riots in Bombay. And this film was inspired by Saeed Mirza's own life. He dedicated it to his mother. And his, his memoir really reveals the ways in which, you know, uh, conversations he had with his parents kind of verbatim make their way into the film. Uh, the aspect of the film that I, you know, that, that really um, captures my, uh, uh, my mind is the sort of opposition in stages between the poet and the television. So you have Kefi Azmi in the room, constantly sort of requesting, you know, uh, his family to turn the TV off, right? But these are these 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 become two distinct public spheres, right? And we we never even actually get to hear Kefi Azmi, the famous poet, recite his famous nazm on on the fall of the Babri Mosque, right? Instead, you have the TV uh, slowly taking over the 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 you know the the whole public sphere, the whole domestic space of the household. And the stories and anecdotes and kissas about um, the past, about uh, whatever the socialist and syncretic literary culture of the past um, symbolized, they retreat into the sphere of private life, into fantasy, right? Um, maybe that's too grim a note to end with and too final a note to end with. So I will say uh, as a kind of counterpoint to what I said that I do think uh, it... We, we, can, we, can, we can't predict uh, when a new literature cinema nexus might emerge in Indian cinema and where it might emerge from. It might be that it will not be modernist stories about underdevelopment, but kind of the, you know, the detective stories, let's say, that are, sto that are sold in railway stations across North India. Maybe that will be the source of a new literature cinema nexus. Or maybe there will be a new film generation in Hindi that, uh, that you know, whose writing, like the writing of Ramesh Bakshi, is deeply imbued with cinema, right? In which the prose itself reflects film in its constitution. It's too early to say. And, and you know, that really would be uh, the subject of another talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Dadawala, for that. And uh, yeah, that, <laughs> that's not the end that we expected because I think after Naseem Saeed Saab also <laughs> left filmmaking, he, he went on traveling across nation and thinking his philosophical, you know, his unique style of thinking, whatever he has developed over the years. But I think that's, that's an interesting take on the Indian wave connected with literature because not just in Hindi, if we talk about the Indian cinema as a whole and the whole of, you know, Girish Kasarwali's work or Adur Gopalakrishnan works, they, they they have made most of their films, they have made, I think, five, six films each with all their films, at least, I think, 90% of their films are based on, uh, you know, regional novels that they have read, um, be it by you or Anand Murthy or other writers. So I think it, it applies not just to Hindi cinema, but across uh, languages, it's the same thing. And but I think in in other regional cinema we still have some films coming up based on uh, literary texts. But in Hindi, because I think uh, I'm not sure, but the globalization played its part. The coming of Karan Johar style filmography, where you had the NRIs taking over, seeing Switzerland and all. What what could be the reason, according to you? Yeah, no, thanks, Ishan. That's a good question. Uh, I do think Hindi after the '90s 
is a real paradoxical public sphere. So on one hand, in numerical terms, Hindi grows and grows, right? It becomes more and more muscular, right? If you look at uh, uh, newspaper circulation records or TV channels uh, and things like that, Hindi is growing. It's taking over space all, all across India. At the same time, what you the, the kind of public sphere that you end up with is a slightly impoverished one, right? Um, literature, uh, the Hindi literary establishment, uh, you know, as you saw with the award Vapsi movement, remains kind of committed to a certain kind of politics. And uh, this establishment finds itself marginalized completely by uh, what uh, Asad Zaidi has called the Peshawari Dunya of Hindi, right? Like the business world of Hindi, the, the big newspapers, the channels, they, they, uh, they don't, uh, you know, the, the literature no longer occupies that kind of space within this public sphere. And what circulates is, you know, Bollywood songs circulate, uh, fragments of religious poems circulate, WhatsApp poetry circulates. But, but uh, you know, so in a sense, uh, you know, there was no need for the Hindi writers to return their awards. The Hindi public had taken the awards back from them already, right? So uh, I, I think you're right. That is the paradox, right? And it's very tough now to imagine uh, the kind of Hindi cosmopolitanism that was a feature of this time, you know. Uh, to me, the great figure is, is someone like Nirmal Varma. You know, Nirmal Varma is in Eastern Europe. His 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 characters uh, in I think London ki ek raat, the character says that I have the dust of many countries under my collar, right? They walk around in Prague talking about films. It's very tough to imagine that kind of breathtaking ambition in Hindi now, right? So it is simultaneously stronger now than it was then, but also weaker in literary terms. So I think that's uh, that's how I would maybe answer your question. That it's 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 a very peculiar feature of the public sphere we have now in Hindi, right? Hmm. Uh, is it also because uh, it was also a time that, you know, I think Raman Kumar in your conversation itself mentioned that uh, it was the time when literary magazines and film magazines were going, the radical film movement was going on. People were, you know, aware of literature, of cinema, but that diminished, that, that didn't quite work out in the 90s and after that, and as you said, Hindi became more popular, but uh, in that popular sense, the, it lost its depth uh, of literature of Nirmal Verma or of Mahadevi Verma or other writers who were writing in Bengali and Hindi. Uh, so I think that's 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 a great uh, point to argue <laughs> for the decline of the new wave. It's not just that uh, the audience lost touch, but it is also that the filmmakers who were trained in FTII or other places they lost touch with their own literature when they were making films do you also believe that yeah. uh so i would put i wouldn't you know it's tough to attribute a causal uh, a single cause right so many things come together in the 1990s and the whole kind of coffee house uh you know culture in in, uh, in india which is really you know that's where the audience is coming from right that's where the demand for these films is coming from they really lose their importance Right. Instead of coffee houses, you have cafe coffee days. Right. And that's a, that's a big change. Right? So it's tough to pinpoint one factor, but I will say uh, it is striking how deep uh, the new waves roots were in vernacular literary culture. And you mentioned the other languages where I think, you know, that contrast also helps us see what Hindi lost in a sense. Right. Um, I mean, again, I'm not saying it's entirely gone. You have uh, people like Varun Grover and others and, and films like Masan sort of bringing back some of that or even other films, I think, where uh, I see uh, the kind of, you know, uh, what was that? Badaiho, where you had the, the sort of Hindi poet being romanticized uh, in, in a very, very sort of sweet and interesting way. So um, I don't know. I don't know if it will return ever again, but um, certainly that institutional power that, you know, something like Dharm Yuga Sarika had to shape public opinion, that is gone. Uh, there is no Hindi writer today who has the stature of someone like Renu or Dharm Veer Bharti, right? Um, nobody has that kind of power to um, uh, be taken as seriously by politics and by the audience as they did, right? And that's, I think that that is where we can see the difference um, between, between then and now. Would you also put films like Garam Hawa or Ankur in the same bracket? I think so. I think so. I mean, uh, that's that's partly what I was trying to argue. I, I did kind of rush through it because I, I I didn't want to take, I know it's late and I didn't want to take up all of your time. But I do think um, the argument I'm trying to make is that literariness goes beyond being adapted from a particular story, right? It shows itself in what are the things we value, right? When you go to see a Salman Khan film like Dabang, 
right? What do you value? You value that moment in which you can throw a coin at the screen or blow the whistle or Bhai takes off his shirt and the audience goes crazy, right? When you go to see these films, what you value often is a literary moment. It's a moment in which, uh, you know, somebody uses a turn of phrase that you are not expecting to hear in the theater. It's that moment in which the monologue, sort of what's happening on screen pauses and the character speaks their mind directly to you, right? And, and you know, and the monologue is, is free of any background sound, right? It's, it's like you can hear MK Rana, MK Rana in 27 Down speaking directly into your soul, right? That's the pleasure that it's, it's, uh, give, it's promising the audience. So, so yeah, I would say even films that are not, uh, and, and you know, Garam Hawa is based on, uh, partially on an Ismat Chiptai uh, uh, story. And, uh, you know, the other, uh, this is okay. This is not exactly an answer to your question, but I will say, you know, in Garam Hawa, it's Kafi Azmi's voice, right? In the end, that says, jo dur se ka karte hai nazara unke liye bhi hai, bhi. and he's, he's sort of calling on the Muslims of North India to join uh, the procession under the red flag. It's the same Kafi Azmi we see in the scene, whose voice is completely sort of defeated by the TV. And I think the fact that it's, it's Azmi playing, in a sense, himself is really what makes that film so special, right? It, he, he embodies literature in that sense. And, you know, I could speak for Kefi Azmi about days, but <laughs> yeah, uh, any he, other question? He, he was the voice of the, the new wave in some sense because Garamawa came at a point when uh, the new wave movement was at its peak. And the last film of uh, Kefi Sahab before he passed away was Naseem. And after, I think he passed two, three years after that film or yeah. in the same year. 90, 94 or 94, 94 I think. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure of the dates, but uh, you can, you know, you, you can see that he's ill in the film. And that's, yes. I think that's what makes it so moving. Yeah. The fact that it, it, it does not show us any violence, but shows us this quieter sort of vision of mourning. Yeah. Yeah. The, the sadness and uh, the loss of, of something very important. Uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, now it's reviving somehow in the, in the south because there is a new film coming up by Mani Ratnam called the Panin Sale one, which is about you know which is a which is a set of novels written in 1950s uh, by a very popular Tamil writer. But again, it's the vernacular, not the the Hindi uh, literature that we are talking about. But I hope there is a revival <laughs> that we, <laughs> we we might initiate some discussions through these yeah. conversations that uh, aspiring filmmakers are watching, aspiring moviegoers are watching. So thank you so much, Dr. Dadawala, for taking out time for this conversation. We, I can't see any questions, but those who have, those who will watch us later, or are watching it later, uh, after a few days, hi to you again. <laughs> but <laughs> please, please send in questions on our email ID. Our email ID is carvanheritage at gmail.com. And uh, Dr. Dadawal, if you can repeat your email ID for the audience. Yeah, it's vikran.dadawal at gmail.com. Uh, V-I-K-R-A-N-T dot D-A-D-A-W-A-L-A. I'm so used to spelling out my name uh, <laughs> at every <laughs> every place I go to in, in the US. So <laughs> it's so, it's now an instinct for me. But yeah, Ishan, thank you so much for uh, having me. And uh, please do, uh, you know, if you have any, uh, you know, anyone who's watching this later, if you do have any stories about the new wave that you want to sh share, if you have any thoughts about uh, Sahityak cinema and what led to its decline that, that you know, you, you, you want to just discuss or any questions, please do get in touch. Um, yeah, and, and thanks again, Ishan, for having